Have you guys ever signed a contract that you have no idea what you're signing? And even if you did sign, even if you did read the thing, would you actually have any idea what it actually means? Well, that's what I'm here for. I'm a real estate broker in the beautiful Southern Georgian Bay area in Ontario. And I'm, this is part two of a three part mini series here. They're, they're all about maybe about 10 minutes long, but I'm just walking you through the agreement of purchase and sale, just kind of going through it briefly. Um, if you, if you have a real estate, uh, agent, um, they should actually go through it. Um, and if they, if they're not, uh, maybe ask them, ask them to, you know, kind of give you the, the layman's terms of the agreement. But otherwise, you can always come here and, and get a good look. Now, by all, by by no sense and by no means am I a lawyer, but I've been doing real estate for a very long time, and I have somewhat of an idea of what the agreement of purchase and sale is all about. So I am going to walk you through this here. Just get me over here. Uh, this is the the basically the uh, third and fourth pages that I and and fifth page. I'm actually going to take you through of the agreement of purchase and sale, and this is typically what we use in organized real estate in Ontario. So on this part, we're going to talk about title search date. What, what on earth is the title search date? Well, that is the date in which your lawyer as a buyer is going to search title to make sure that uh, there's no liens, encumbrances, or you know any back taxes owing. That's the brief of, of searching title. And also to make sure that uh, the seller is actually who says, who, who says he is the owner is actually the owner. Uh, the next thing is uh, future use here we have. So all that's really the brief of that is, is stating that if it's sold as a residential property, there's no representation that it can be switched to a commercial property or anything of that nature. The next thing here we have the uh, title search, or sorry, the title. So basically that's just stating that you'll get, as a buyer, you would get free, good and free, clear title except for there are going to be some easements on your property, you know, like public utilities, gas and hydro, water, sewer, that sort of thing. That, those are easements, um, not major easements, just those are all minor, considered minor. Then we talk about closer, closing arrangements. That's where each, the buyer and the seller both retain their own lawyer to complete this transaction. And they talk about how they're going to uh, close the deal. That's, that's what that talks about. And that's, that's what your lawyer's there for. He, he's the one that makes all the closing arrangements. Then we talk about documents and discharge. So basically this talks about how any existing mortgages will be discharged on closing. It also talks about if a seller has any things like the um, you know surveys or any any contracts that are relevant to the property that they'll they'll uh, produce that uh, for this for the purchaser. That's what that talks about. Number 13, that talks about the inspection. So this is important. Some people mistake this for something that it's not. So this is really, this is actually almost a waiver of a home inspection. So this is, a, this is stating that the buyer has a right to a home inspection. And if he doesn't include it in Schedule A or another part of the agreement, then he's waiving his right to a home inspection or an inspection of the property. Then we have insurance. This states that the seller uh, is to keep insurance on the property for in the uh, unfortunate event that say the property burns or part of it burns. Then, then at this point, it says right here, you can see that the buyer may, may either terminate this agreement and have all his money returned without interest or deduction, or he may take the proceeds from the insurance to, and complete the transaction. So those are things to be, ter be determined, and you would, you would discuss that with your lawyer as well. So, you know, if you have no place to go and, you know, you, you still want to buy the property, by all means, this is something that states that the seller must keep it insured. So that's very important. So if you're a seller, your realtor should go over that with you to make sure. Because there are seniors out there or people who've owned the property who do not have a mortgage on the property anymore. So they figure, why, why, why should I insure it? Um, most, most lawyers will not close an agreement of purchase and sale uh, until the buyer actually also has insurance that but that's not what this is talking about but also just so that's part so you know that that is part of your mortgage conditions anybody getting a mortgage must have insurance then we talk about the planning act that that talks about that the property complies with the planning act and that's something that your lawyer will look into for you then we see we see about the uh document preparation the transfer deed this is not talking about the land transfer affidavit that's a totally separate thing this is just talking about the transfer of deed then you have residency. This is important too. If you are a seller that is not a resident of Canada, so that's non-residency. 
So typically what happens is the seller, when he sells the property, the lawyers will hold proceeds back from the sale in order to confirm there are no outstanding income tax um, um, issues at hand. But this is something that, that the seller should take up with his accountant prior to listing the property, just so you don't have any any hiccups on closing. So, so that, that really deals with the seller, not the buyer. Then we have adjustments. So adjustment talks about, so if you have, uh, say you're the seller and you've paid your taxes, um, you know, three months in advance and you're closing and there's still two months left of that, well, that would become an adjustment and you, the seller, would get that refund back from the buyer. So that would be part of an adjustment. That's just one example. Then we have property assessment. So what this talks about is, um, properties can be reassessed or may be reassessed on an annual basis. So the property values may go up or down and that affects your taxes and so forth. So what this is stating is that the buyer and the seller will not make any claim against the buyer or seller or any real estate brokerage in who's a party to this agreement. That's what that's talking about. Time limits. That talks about, so if there's time limits set in this agreement, so say you have a condition that needs to be met by, by Friday at, at four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, you have to complete that by that time. The same with closing date. So if it says that it's closing June 30th at 6 p.m., well, then that's when it's got to close or else, or else the deal's dead or there may be other implications that go with that. Then we talk about tender. So that's not just talking about cash. That's also or like the way you pay for it. It's also talking about documents. So, but typically when it comes to the money part, the money, you never see it. It goes from your bank to the seller's bank. Well, actually, a lot of times it goes from one seller's trust account, lawyer's trust account, to another lawyer's trust account, and then it goes to the the uh, the seller afterwards. Then we talk about Family Law Act. This is important if we're dealing with a divorce situation or uh, some kind of a separation. Um, if it's considered a matrimonial home, then definitely this would come into play. So if you're divorced and you have a spouse that, that bought that property with you, why then you need to have her or him sign that that agreement because if they don't sign it you don't have an agreement and you could end up in court because that person could come back and make a claim on that and then it would really mess up the deal and then the buyer's not going to be happy neither so make sure that you have that conversation with your realtor if you have if you have a a, a divorce a, a spouse that that no longer lives at the property but has lived with you there in the past UFI, that's urea formaldehyde insulation. So basically what that means is that the seller has to disclose if he knows that there is urea formaldehyde insulation in the property. So if he doesn't know, he can't disclose it. But if he does, he must disclose it. It is, it is the law. You have to do that. Uh, this also states that uh, number 24 talks about legal, accounting, and environmental advice. So basically that's saying that the brokerage is not providing you with legal, tax, or environmental advice. Um, if you have a good realtor, your realtor will recommend that you get that advice, especially when you need it. So if you're dealing with tax implications, like say the seller, you're the seller, and you are a non-resident, then yeah, absolutely, your your realtor should should advise you to speak with your accountant. You should also speak to your lawyer as well. Also, too, if there's environmental issues, like uh, say you're selling a commercial property and let's say you have fuel tanks on the property, maybe you have to do a phase one assessment. Um, but those are some of the things. It is good for your realtor to have a broad experience of things um, so that they can pick up on these things. They won't be an expert in law, tax, or uh, environmental issues, but at least they can point you in the right direction. Consumer report, that would apply if you're, if you're talking about, um, say there's a seller take back mortgage, say the seller is gonna hold part of a mortgage, they're gonna wanna do a consumer report on you. Uh, you know, check your credit history. And then number 26, this talks about the agreement in writing. So really this talks about, um, there's the main pre-printed part, which is the first uh, four pages. Then you have schedule A or schedule B, or there could be as many schedules as you want. But more in particular, we're talking about schedule A, which talks about all the conditions. That would supersede anything in the pre-printed part because that's things that the buyer and seller are coming up with that they agree to, and that supersedes anything in Because uh, for an example, the deposit in the, on the first page talks about how, that's to, how the deposit is supposed to be put in the, into the real estate brokerage trust account within 24 hours of the offer being accepted. Well, you may put something in Schedule A that states that you want 48 hours or you want to say that this, the, the deposit is going to be paid over a period of time. That would supersede that part on, page, on the first page of the agreement. 
And if you have any confusion or if that doesn't make any sense, by all means, send me a question or, or give me a shout and I'll try to explain it better to you. Then we have 27. It talks about electronic signatures. So that just states that, that the parties, the buyer and the seller, consent and agree to electronic uh, signatures. If you don't, you need to discuss that with your realtor right away at this point. Date and time, that talks about the date and time which, which the property is uh, placed in. So say your property is being sold, it's in Ontario, but the buyer is from British Columbia. Well, they're three hours behind Ontario. So you want to make sure that, that your buyer in British Columbia knows that because they could lose out for that three hour difference in time. So they could miss out on the agreement and things could become uh, pretty messy at that point. Then we're going to go down to 29. This is the last page I'm going to talk about today. We're going to talk about Schedule A in a different day. So here's, we talk about successor and assigns. So as a buyer, you would sign here under seal, and then you're also stating that your heirs, executors, administrators, and successor and assigns are bound by the terms of this agreement. So if you make this agreement, your, your heirs and executors and so forth are bound by the terms of this agreement. So they're bound by this agreement of purchase and sale. It just doesn't die when you die. Or if, so, or if you become incapacitated, it's still, that has to be dealt with. Then we talk about here, this is where the seller signs, right in here. He also is signing under seal, and he's bound by the terms of this. Also, the thing is here, right here, it states that the seller irrevocably instructs his lawyer to pay any brokerages, any outstanding commissions that are due on closing. But that happens on closing, it comes out of the proceeds of the sale. So the seller doesn't actually take it out of his own pocket, it comes out of the proceeds. Then we're going to talk about this, pro, this uh, spousal consent. That's what we briefly talked about before. So if there is a divorce situation, or maybe maybe the property was just simply bought in him or her name, one of you, but it's a matrimonial home and you both own it, but the spouse is not, the other spouse is not on title, the spouse still has to sign here. Even though she's not on title, if it's her matrimonial home or his matrimonial home, he has to sign or else it's not, this, this is not a valid agreement. So then we have confirmation of acceptance. This is the last person to agree to all the terms in the entire agreement of purchase and sale. Um, so that's very important. That doesn't get signed until everything is signed. Actually, I'm gonna back up. I got ahead of myself here. Something I wanna talk about. Um, agreement in writing here. Yeah, I wanna talk about this here for a second. This here talks about all any uh, schedules and so forth, but listen, there cannot be any collateral or agreements outside of this agreement of purchase and sale. So so say you want to pay the seller 500000 but we know that the property is worth a million bucks. You can't have a, an agreement of purchase and sale for 500000 and then have a private agreement of purchase and sale for another 500000 outside of this just to avoid you know, paying taxes or paying land transfer tax or paying, trying to avoid that or trying to pay, avoid paying real estate commissions. You need to have that conversation with your realtor at that time of how you're going to deal with any things of trying to save money. Don't do this. You could end up at your, getting yourself in a lot of hot water. So make sure that, that you're on the same page with your realtor when you're dealing with agreement in writing, any agreements in writing. So make sure you talk, so sorry about that. I just want to back up because I was getting ahead of myself. Um, so then, so we talked about the confirmation of acceptance. That's when everybody agrees to it. The last person to agree to everything, that's when they sign it. So then we, this here, this is just information about the brokerages, if there's brokerages involved, the listing brokerage and the cooperating brokerage. Then we have, this is the acknowledgement right here. So that's where the seller signs and the buyer signs and the other side. But listen, you do not sign this until everybody agrees to everything and the confirmation of acceptance is signed. Do not sign this until the acceptance is signed. Lots and lots and lots and lots of people sign this before the acceptance is signed. Because this is stating right here, it says, I acknowledge receipt of my signed copy of the accepted agreement of purchase and sale. So that means accepted, but you can't, you're not supposed to sign this until it's all accepted. It doesn't mean it's a firm deal yet, just means that it's accepted. So, but lots of times I see this come across my desk where this is signed before the confirmation of acceptance is signed. So just wait, no big deal. Wait until it's accepted, then you can sign this, no big deal. But sign it in the right process. Then you have the commission agreement, sorry, commission trust agreement. So this is between the brokerages. So this just says, states that the listing brokerage is gonna pay the cooperating brokers, that they, they have an agreement 
between the brokerages. So whatever the, the listing agreement, so the, the listing brokerage will have a listing agreement with the seller, which we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to get into that a whole nother time. That'll be another, another uh, topic we'll talk about later. But I just wanted to bring that up just so that you're clear on, on what that is you're signing. Then we're going to, not today, but we're going to talk about another day about the Schedule A. This is where you put all your conditions and statements and clauses and so forth. But there's differences between statements and conditions, clauses, um, all that stuff. We're going to talk about differences between those and what you should and shouldn't involve in that or what you should include and when you should or shouldn't include it and the risks involved with that. So, but that's for a whole nother day. So I'm getting ahead of myself. So um, let's, let's, let's just end it right there. So if you have any questions, by all means, give me a shout. Trust me, I am not a lawyer. Never been, never want to be. But listen, I have been in this real estate for a long, long time. So I've done a lot, a lot of agreement of purchase and sales. So um, by all means, if you have any questions, uh, give me a shout and uh, I'll try to um, clear things up for you. And if I can't, why then I will send you to a lawyer and I know lots of them that will be able to help you out. And uh, they may or may not be able to put it in layman's terms, but uh, you know, hopefully they'll be able to help you. So there you go. That's my help for you today. I hope it was uh, of value to you. And uh, as, a, as a local realtor in the Southern Georgian Bay area in Ontario, I am trying to provide more value for you. And uh, so until next time, have yourself a great day. Thanks again and take care.